But anyway, um, so Professor Nefka is going to talk about the progressive collapse, which of course is a very important topic since uh, 2001, the 9-11 incident. I think this topic is one of the most researched and important topics ever since. So without further ado, I'd like to interview, uh, uh, invite David to come over and give us a talk. Well, good morning everybody. It's uh, a delight for me to be back in Hong Kong once again. I think the first time I came here, the Bank of China, which you would have seen on the uh, initial slide, was I think one cross high. So I can date my, uh, my visit from that. Uh, I'm going to talk about progressive collapse. I'm going to talk about it in a very general sense. Now, for people of my age, we are all supposed to know where we were when we heard about the assassination of President Kennedy in Dallas in the United States. But in 2001, another event occurred where I think most of us in this room will recall how we heard about the collapse of the World Trade Center in New York. An event that was played out on the television screens of billions of people across the world. How could these iconic buildings, designed by one of the world's great structural engineers, Les Robinson, collapse in front of our eyes? Well, some 50 years previously, another incident occurred in New York, where a US Air Force plane became disorientated in low cloud and crashed into the Empire State Building. It did relatively little damage the building was subsequently repaired and the incident was really lost in history until it was resurrected in the wake of the World Trade Center. Why was it that that uh, incident produced a repairable situation whereas the World Trade Center led to spectacular collapses? And that's been the subject of considerable interest to the structural engineering profession over the past 20 years or so. So let's go back into history. The Eiffel Tower is of course built of iron, but it has all the characteristics of a steel structure. And it's important because at the time, mechanics was strong in France, and this is one of the first structures worldwide to benefit from some scientific calculation, determination of the internal forces, portioning of members to take them and so forth. Some 50 years previously, Robert Stevenson, the well-known uh, railway engineer in Britain, designed the Britannia Bridge, which is the one in the foreground. The bridge in the background is actually a suspension bridge designed by Thomas Telford, the first president of the Institution of Civil Engineers. The bridge in the front is actually a um, a modification to the original because in 1976, which was notable in Britain because it was until this year the hottest summer on record, and the bridge was damaged by a fire on the girder. And in um, rectifying that, the opportunity was taken to put the trusses underneath and to put a road over the top. But the interesting point to note here is these towers and the ports that were originally provided to house suspension cables of the sort that we see in Telford's Bridge. Because the engineering community of the day felt it was impossible to span that sort of distance without suspension cables. But Stevenson was persistent. He went to two professors at London University, Fairburn, and Hopkinson, one an expert in mechanics and one an expert in materials, and through a combination of laboratory testing and calculation, they were able to demonstrate that it was indeed possible to span this distance. And this is a very early illustration of the direct use of up-to-date knowledge and research findings in actual construction to effect a substantial change to the prevailing wisdom of the time. Structural design nowadays 
is well advanced and has a scientific basis. It wasn't always such. I mean, in the Middle Ages, uh, in countries across Europe, cathedrals were built, and each one was a little bit more adventurous than the previous one, and if it collapsed, nobody much knew about it because there was no internet, no CNN rolling news, and the designers of the next one would be a little bit more cautious. Then we have science mechanics to underpin the design of structures, and we have a series of different design approaches, the most recent of which is the so-called performance base that comes from the seismic community. But most of us are still working with limit space design and recognize two conditions, the ultimate limit space, the maximum load the structure can take, and serviceability, frequently observed loads which should not impair the performance of the structure, the vibration of the floors in a building, for example. And we all know illustrations of where this goes wrong. This is the Milford Haven Bridge, in, uh, also in Wales and in Britain. It was my first involvement in an academic consulting job to assist my then PhD supervisor in trying to help the British Ministry of Transport understand quite what had happened in that structure. And it was in fact relatively straightforward to work out that the diaphragm was underdesigned because it was just too adventurous at the time. We didn't know as much as we thought we knew. The result of that, an enormous program of research, not just in the UK but also in, uh, in Germany, in Australia because of the Westgate collapse, and indeed in the United States as well, that put this subject on an altogether different footing. Serviceability. Frequently, it's about the maximum deflection a structure can take, and of course it depends on circumstances. Here we see the foreground of German farmer in a cow shed with some milking stalls, and if you look above his head, they're storing bales of hay on top of these herding members. And these are channel sections that were originally vertical. They've now rotated to 90 degrees. And the structure is effectively being held up by these uh, sag bars, which are acting as, as, as ties to provide a two-way spanning arrangement. If we go back, this chap is unconcerned about what's happening up there. Because it's only cows underneath, and the consequences you know, are not that severe. So serviceability it depends very much on the prevailing situation. And we've devised a way of uh, in structure engineering of handling conventional structural design. Four steps representing the loads, doing some analysis, which nowadays means using computer software, deciding on a suitable acceptance criteria, and then comparison and then revision to see if we are over-designed or under-designed to refine the design. And that works very well. We can all recognize that. Until something different happens. 1968 in London, old lady living on the 18th floor of this 22-story precast concrete system-built apartment produced in the aftermath of the Second World War uh, to provide housing in London to replace that that was destroyed uh, due to the, uh, the air raids and so forth. Um, she got up, she lit a match, there was a gas explosion. It blew out the corner of that structure. Subsequent investigation showed that the pressure generated by the explosion was about the same as being in three meters of water, in other words, the deep end of a swimming pool. Not a very severe test. But of course, the structure had not been designed to take account of something of that sort. In fact, it was not very well constructed either. It led to a moratorium on gas in high-rise buildings and to the uh, appearance of new terms in the vocabulary of structural engineers. Progressive collapse, disproportionate collapse, robustness. How do we deal with those sorts of topics? There was a government inquiry, there was a publicly uh, available report published, and it culminated with some recommendations on how to deal with this in structures. But it happens to concrete buildings of uh, other types of forms of construction. This is the Murray Building in Oklahoma City in the United States. 
This was a result of bomb damage uh, on the ground floor. And of course, the World Trade Center, where we saw buildings in the top left-hand corner hit by the aircraft, reduced to the rubble that we see in the bottom right-hand corner. I was actually fortunate to be able to visit the site shortly afterwards. And that pile of rubble you can see on the bottom right-hand corner is actually the equivalent of an 11-storey building. Uh, now, of course, all completely renovated. So at Imperial, in the uh, early part of this, uh, this millennium, we set up a small research project to try and understand what it was that controlled robustness and progressive tendency for progressive collapse in steel structures. And we looked around for information and assistance from the history of structural engineering, not necessarily progressive collapse, because there are so few incidents. It is by definition a rare uh, but high consequence phenomenon. So we looked at war damage build, bomb damage buildings in central London, and the Institute of Civil Engineers has a very comprehensive record of this in the publication. And we can see here what we call continuous reaction, where this was obviously a beam, but because it's not become separated from the column, this is now acting more like a cable with enormous deflection, something like twice the depth of the structure, but maintaining the integrity of the structure. Might continuous reaction or something like that be important to resisting progressive collapse. Here's a, another illustration where we can see enormous deformation. So the ductility here, able to absorb the forces from the bomb damage, and again, no separation of the structure. So we can see two or three potential features here that might be important in understanding how to address progressive collapse. And then thirdly, this is a uh, earthquake damage building in Mexico City. We can see some evidence of duct ductility here, energy absorption through deformation. And again, it's badly damaged, but the floor beams have not become separated from the columns, and so the structure has not actually collapsed. So from this, we decided that there are a number of physical features that were important in understanding the mechanics of progressive collapse. It happens quickly. It's a dynamic occurrence. So static analysis isn't going to work. What's crucial and what differentiates the Empire State Building from the World Trade Center was the ability of the damaged structure to come to a new equilibrium position and to remain stable. What's important for that? Preventing separation of the components. So the connections between the beams and the columns, for example, in a regular building structure, are crucial in resisting progressive collapse. And what sort of phenomena are mobilized? Well, gross deformations. We saw the bomb damage building in London. We don't normally think of deflections of beams being twice the depth of the beam. They're a small fraction. And clearly, it's not elastic inelastic behavior, permanent deformation, and so on. We also, at the same time, kept in mind that we wanted the approach that we would devise to addressing progressive collapse to look similar to the en engineer to conventional structural design. Similar set of calculations or similar process, similar volume of work, and not to be something that was available only to a very few experts using very sophisticated techniques. Now, from the uh, Ronan Point uh, inquiry report, we can identify three potential approaches, time forces, alternate load path, and key elements, and latterly, because we like probability and statistics and risk and so on, we've introduced that into the framework for assessing um, progressive collapse uh, inferences. Tying forces really say that if you tie the building together by having a degree of tensile resistance in the connections between the beams and the columns, uh, that it will perform better than if you don't. It's qualitative. There is no mechanism for using this to actually compare one example with another. So it's just in the, it's better to do this. It will be more robust if you do. 
key elements, see we see actually this is a, a fire situation where the top row of poles are fire protected and the lower bottom ones aren't. And we can see that the ones that are protected have performed better in the fire in this structure. So we could design certain key elements to have a greater margin of safety. Again, it's an approach. Transfer girders, for example, in buildings like hotels where you've got large uh, spans in the, in the lower floors. But probably the most useful of these is the so-called alternate load path, which really says, if we imagine a component removed, a column as shown here, is the remaining damaged structure able to bridge across there and attain an equilibrium position that maintains the integrity of the structure? That's amenable to analysis. Now, the conference in the United States in San Francisco uh, just over 20 years ago, a noted American researcher who worked for many years at the National Bureau of Standards in, in the US, uh, said there was virtually no research in the US in progressive collapse. Well, 20 years later, the situation changed enormously with uh, groups in most countries around the world actively investigating this. Uh, I got uh, some help with producing this, and I'm assuming that this was done with some sort of uh, web crawler, so that actually this line, if you, uh, if you went on two or three more years, it would sort of go up and drop again, because it's all to do with the searching. It's not a sudden reduction in the, in the interest in the subject. I don't believe that's happened. So current research around the world falls in really into three categories. Numerical or analytical, risk and probability, which is more a way of looking at the problem, and what I call targeting, which is really focusing on aspects of the problem. Numerically, we have enormous computing power. In the wake of the World Trade Center collapses, National Bureau of Standards uh, or in, in the United States put the largest computers they had to work on numerical simulations of what had happened. Some of these uh, runs lasted for weeks, and you got one result. So it, it can be done, but it's not a very practical approach, thinking in terms of real engineering. Risk and probability approaches gives us ways of thinking this. How do we deal with these high consequence, low probability events? What, what's the right approach to take? It's discipline in our thinking. But the targeted research, and here we see on the top left, uh, testing in University of Austin in Texas in the United States, and the bottom right uh, in Liège in Belgium, trying to understand the actual mechanics of progressive collapse in the various components. And you can see on the right hand side, once again, we have to think of different forms of testing because we're thinking of a completely different regime, enormous deflections in the structure. So we go back to the desirable features of a design approach. This is a slide you've seen before. And in here we were thinking, how could we couch the outcome from our research into a similar sort of process? So we looked at simplifying the problem. If we imagine a frame structure, we remove one column here, and we look at the ability of this damaged structure to form a new equilibrium position. Well, all the bays uh, above that are going to behave in a similar fashion, so we can isolate that part of the structure. We can then look at a typical floor and examine that in terms of behavior of individual beams. Most structure engineers are far more comfortable dealing with individual beams than they are complex non-linear analysis of three-dimensional frame structures. So we try to work in their terms. And here we see what is a key to understanding this. This is vertical load against vertical deflection for a single beam. Now, we start with linear elastic behavior, and that's where we're normally working in real structures. And then we get to what we would normally say is a sort of maximum load ultimate limit state for collapse. But in fact, if we keep going, there is an enormous possibility beyond there, and eventually, this line starts to rise as a continuing reaction starts to happen. Now, it may not be possible physically in the structure, because we need enormous deflections, a lot of deformation capacity in key components. But what we see here 
is the ability to analyze like that, which initially was numerical, but one of our rather clever research students um, reconfigured the traditional slope deflection equations into a form that would recognize the conditional features. And the comparison here is with adapting, which is nonlinear analysis. And then we have the so-called model, which is simple hand calculation. It means we can do hundreds of calculations almost instantaneously because it's explicit expressions and a spreadsheet. So it's very easy to examine lots of cases. So we then go on to put this into the context of a, a grillage, a floor grillage in a structure. And we devise this robustness assessment framework, as we call it, from the team at Imperial College. And Professor El Pazuli, who's in the audience, was one of the academics who was also very much involved with that, bringing his expertise from the seismic side uh, to, to address this. And also, uh, Asaf Isidin, another professor on the numerical side. So we have complementary expertise. And the key features really are that there's no dynamic analysis required because uh, Professor Isidin was able to devise a very clever energy balance method, which meant we could convert the results of a static analysis into a dynamic response without doing any dynamics in the calculations. We can work at the beam, substructure, grillage level, so more calculations normally get improved result, but you can stop when you've shown that it's satisfactory. Criterion of failure, separation of the connections as expressed by existing, uh, sorry, exhausting the deformation capacity of key components in the connection. So understanding what's happening there. We can make quantitative comparisons. Is scheme A better than scheme B? Is scheme A too safe? Can we refine it downwards? Does it need some additional features in it and so on? And it's very quick to do. So initially we were working with the uh, Arabs, the consulting uh, engineers who, who has helped uh, sponsor a PhD student working on this. And they had a structure under design in London. It was a bit odd in that it used rather uh, heavy beams and so on. But they asked us to use this as a, a, a model to try things out. And so we looked at two scenarios, losing a corner column and losing an edge column. And just to give you a flavor of some of the findings, five cases here. The first four all treat the floors as composite and the joints as composite. The bottom one treats it as bare steel. The interesting feature is on the extreme right hand side, which shows that the bare steel case gets nowhere near supporting the necessary loading. Largely because of insufficient uh, rotational stiffness and moment capacity in the simple steel connections. As we put in more reinforcement or we resist pulling of the structure, um, we get improvements and the composite ones, as you can see, are more or less okay. We also then looked at the correlation of time capacity, because that's the main way this is dealt with in the, in the UK, provide time resistance in the beam to column connections. And we see here the resistance to progressive collapse against the time resistance provided by the connections. And I don't think there's much correlation there. You, know, you can see similar Time resistance, a factor of what? Two and a half, three, or what? No, four to one in terms of resistance to progressive collapse. Alternatively, you can get the same sort of resistance to progressive collapse by doubling or even quadrupling the time resistance. We now know, because we've looked at this more carefully, that there is a subtle relationship between aspects of what controls the behavior of the connection, time resistance, and resistance to progressive collapse but it's more sophisticated than just time resistance itself. And here we see the low deflection behavior for the beam. This would be our normal linear elastic behavior. And we were able to identify different stages where different physical mechanisms came into play to provide resistance. And if we get to this point, then we're into this tensile catenary stage but we need enormous deflections to get there. And in the majority of practical cases, the physical connections cannot support the amount of rotation that's needed to get to that stage. So 
in principle, Coutinho reactions looks attractive, but actually achieving it is somewhat difficult. We also found that the forces in a typical connection, which we would design it for bending moment and uh, the vertical loading, that's the initial part, but then we get compressive force and we end up with a lot of time forces and almost no moment. So the connections are actually required to resist a very different set of forces in a progressive collapse situation than those for which they're designed under normal gravity and wind load. And we can look at Greenwich's here. We take out uh, different column removals, bare steel, composite, and we can look at what controls the arrangements of. But we can do these calculations very quickly, and from that we can build up a picture of what it is that is basically controlling things. Most of the work we did was dealing with frames that resist horizontal loading due to the thickness of the cores, but we also looked at moment frames. Behavior is rather different. The connections, this is type used in the United States, post Northridge, to introduce ductility. Also, it's common practice there to leave this corner column floating to avoid introducing biaxial bending under seismic action. That's actually a very bad feature when we look at progressive collapse. It's a real point of weakness in the structure. And we can contrast in a simple way so-called simply designed frames and moment frames and see what the best sort of intervention is in each case to improve resistance. So, in summary, as a result of the long program of, of research, all done by PhD students, so you're relatively inexpensive this, uh, in terms of uh, university research, um, we can summarize here, and the conclusions, we now have a situation where concern is heightened, but there are ways, without going into complex, nonlinear numerical analysis, to actually understand what's happening and to design to provide greater resistance to progressive collapse. With that, I'd like to close and to thank you all very much for your attention.